Hello to everyone who is watching. My name is Lorina Sietsevichus. I'm the host of this uh, channel. And here we try to create space for interesting conversations on important topics, which have to do with theology, philosophy, and worldviews. And most of my shows are recorded in Lithuanian and are being done in Lithuanian, which is my native tongue. But today, since I'm here uh, in Malta, uh, we'll do this conversation in, um, in English and we'll see how it goes. Hopefully it goes well. And today my guest is um, Dr. Reverend Stefan Attard, who is both an academic and a priest. And we'll talk about none other than um, exorcisms and deliverance which is a big topic, a pretty controversial topic, not only among Christians, but also in the wide world. Uh, a lot of people take different stances on the demonic, on the spiritual. Uh, what do we do um, with all these kinds of issues? And especially in the modern world, how do we approach uh, them? Uh, can the demonic, demonic be explained only um, in psychological terms, uh, for example? So we'll talk about all these uh, issues. But I said that Dr. Stefan Attard is my guest today, but rather I probably am his guest because we're gathered in the church where he is ministering, uh, St. Julian's Parish Church here in Malta. So thank you for uh, having us. It's great having you, Melora, really. Thank you for being here. Um, so um, let us start with uh, the, the most basic question uh, that I usually start my, all my conversations with. It's uh, how did you come to know Jesus and how did you start to follow him? It's a beautiful question and thank you for asking it because it's always an opportunity to share the faith with, with uh, whoever is listening to you. And uh, I, I was raised in a, in a Catholic family. My parents were devout Catholics and uh, we, we were raised uh, in, in an environment of, of prayer. And, and I, I really acknowledge this and I appreciate the fact that they helped me to connect from a young age. But there was also something that I felt was God's grace as well that happened within within my heart, uh, even beyond what my parents were giving me. Because at school, we had a mass that was celebrated during the break. We had an hour's break. And uh, of course, the mass would take about 30 minutes. But for some reason, without my parents ever having asked me to go, I just felt the need to go and be with Jesus for that half hour of my break. And uh, I really, attribute this to, to the Lord's own calling, his, his wooing me, his, his invitation. And well, that grew with me. And um, eventually, rather than coming to the faith, I would say that my faith deepened and, and it deepened in this way. Uh, there was, there was, the Lord was really good to me. There, there was a, a youth group that my mother mentioned to me uh, in a particular parish which I was living in back then when I was, I was 15. I started going because there was a there was a girl I really liked, so I hope I hoped she would be there. And sure enough, she was at this meeting. But I didn't like it at all. I didn't like the meeting at all. Uh, it happened to be a charismatic meeting, and I, I had no clue about people praying in tongues and and being charismatic and so on. But I kept going because of this girl, hoping to get to know her and all that. And eventually, I got used to the style of prayer, to the way they express themselves, and I felt comfortable. Uh, and uh, yet I had a problem because I, though I was attending this group, I wasn't really praying on a personal level. I wasn't spending time with Jesus, no? Then another friend of mine invited me to another group. And this was a, a, a very strong youth group in Malta. It's called Youth Fellowship. It's still uh, very well attended. I think it's the best youth group there is around. And um, that is where someone started teaching me how to use the scriptures, how to really meditate and, you know, marking the Bible and so on and, and spend time in prayer, you know, a solid hour every day. And that is when this kind of transformation happened within me and Jesus became so much more personal you know and and the, the Bible became so much more alive so that was I was about 17 18 when this happened and and uh, of course I was prayed over there was the baptism in the Holy Spirit mm. after the life in the spirit seminars and that was a transformation that was not so much immediate as I think it was more of a gradual change but I could see how my perception uh, of the faith uh, changed and my understanding of Jesus and the scriptures changed as a result even of that immersion uh, in the spirit. 
So, well, since you're a priest now, I assume you're, you're not with that girl. Hopefully not. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <And, laughs> so, well, how, how did you dis then decide to become a, a priest? Yes, okay. So, okay, this goes back to my childhood years as well. Yeah, when I was about seven, my brother, I've got a brother who's five years older, and I always looked up to him. So, once someone asked him, he, he, he was about 12 years old, I was about seven, uh, what would you like to be when you, when you grow up? And he said, I'd like to be a priest. And suddenly, this little brother, he was me, <clears throat> look up, looking up to my brother, he said, yes, me too, I want to be a priest as well. So, anyway, eventually I started attending the, <clears throat> excuse me, the vocations meetings organized by the Carmelite priests of the parish where we were living. But when I was about 15, actually even before then, uh, when I was 13, I, I also started, I chose sciences uh, at school, which means that I, I, actually I, I wished to become a doctor as well. So I, was, I started passing through these different phases. At times I wanted to be uh, a priest, and at other times I wanted to get married and, have, and uh, have a profession, the profession of a medic, of a doctor. So eventually what happened is that it, when I was about uh, eight, nine, 18, 19, I had to do my exams again for the second time to get straight A's in order to, to be able to enter the, the course, to start the medicine course. And, um, during that period when I was studying intensely, I just felt this calling. It coincided with the time when I started going to youth fellowship. When actually what happened is that I saw how Jesus was touching so many people's lives. Uh, there, were, there were people whose marriages, couple, a particular couple, uh, whose marriage was really on the rocks and they, they came to the Lord and that marriage was healed, you know, and strengthened. There were people who were healed physically, people who were healed emotionally, psychologically. Conversions I could, I could see uh, in people around me. And I just felt this is Jesus' work and this is what Jesus is doing. So uh, that really helped me to shift my attention from the priesthood because Yes, I was attracted. To, I had been attracted to the priesthood before. I, I, I was maybe impressed by what the priest was doing at the altar and all that uh, in the sacraments. But then it wasn't just an attraction for the priesthood as such. It was an attraction for Christ that, that I received, that I started having thanks to this group, thanks to what was happening around me. And this is what drew, drew me then to uh, wanting to do more for Jesus and wanting to be part of this huge ministry, you know, of reaching out to people. And um, I, I, had to ch I had to basically decide, but I felt extremely peaceful with, yes, putting aside that girl and all the others, of course, um, uh, and choosing this vocation, you know, which, which was, for me, it, it had become the, the, the best means, personally, how I could bring Jesus to others. Okay? So, of course, that is not the case for everyone, but I felt this was my personal calling. And, um, well, actually, you know, given that, uh, that background, uh, the place where we met might uh, kind of uh, sound a little bit weird because we met at the university. I came here for an internship and then I was referred to you, you know, to, to, to you know, just get some consultations about my, my thesis and about the things that I'm uh, interested in. And uh, during our first conversation, I, I think um, this, this whole issue of, uh, well, not quite issue, but I mean, you just um, kind of told me that one of your ministries that you're involved in is deliverance and exorcisms. Yes, and, yes. And, and we're talking about that at the university, yes, <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, which you know, and for some people, those two worlds might seem, you know, like irreconcilable. Yes, 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 yes you know, yes. How, how can you, as an academic, uh, and we'll talk briefly about that? How did you, you know, decide to go into the academy? Okay, because not okay. every priest decides to you get a doctorate in, you know, in something. Okay. Uh, but but you not only it seems well I assume that you believe, you know, in the in the, the spiritual <laughs> realm and the demonic, yes. right? And you're dealing with it in one yes. way or the other. Yes. And we'll get to that uh, uh, really, you know, uh, quickly. But um, let's start with the question of why then you decided to go into the academy? So, okay, coming to Christ or growing yes. in the faith, deepening your faith, then deciding to become a priest and then going into the academy. Uh, why? why did I decide? Yeah. Well, it's, it wasn't really my decision. It was the bishop's decision. <laughs> uh, the bishop selects a number of priests and he sends us abroad to, to study. But the thing is, uh, initially they were going to uh, send me to study psychology. 
uh, and uh, then for some reason the bishop changed his mind. Uh, one of the reasons was that I had to wait another three years or so in order to uh, join a, a specific course because they ask you to do some uh, life for growth formation, something of the sort, and in order to be ready to start the course. And uh, so he told me, look, choose something else, choose another subject. And uh, of course, because scripture had become so important to me, I said, okay, I'll choose the Bible. The problem is that the, the, the course at, on the Bible at, in Rome uh, is, is the longest one. Together with sacred music, uh, the, the course in scripture is, takes about nine years or, or, or yeah, more or less nine or just over nine years. So I said, okay, I, I would like to study scripture and the bishop agreed. And uh, so I said, okay, we'll start off with the first course, which is four years, and then we'll see, we'll take it from there. And eventually I carried on. They asked me to carry on in order to come back and teach at university. So it wasn't fully my decision. Of course, I had to accept, but you kind of, you, you, you expected to, to accept, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's not that they're going to force you really, but I was happy. I was happy to, make, to, to, to be given this opportunity, which was very, very enriching. So your subject was biblical studies, more or less? Yes, totally. Yes, that's okay. it. So, uh -huh. and, and, and the main topic that you researched? So the, in the first four years, apart from the languages, of course, that we studied, the Greek and Hebrew, most especially, and some others, um, my main area of research was St. Paul. And I, I wrote on 1 Corinthians 14 on the gift of tongues and prophecy. Of course, probably because of my charismatic background, not probably, definitely because of for, for that reason, and uh, and then I was asked, and this was a difficult choice, I had to make, or well, I was kind of forced to do it, basically, I was asked to go into the Old Testament because uh, the lecturer in Old Testament studies was about to retire, so. And he himself, who was guiding me, told me, look, you have to take my place. And then he said something which really made me surrender. I was trying, struggling and trying to convince him that I should carry on with Paul. He said, look, we study to serve the church. And, you know, I was sent by the church. They were paying all my fees and all that. I was coming back to serve the church. So fair enough. I surrendered and I said, OK, I'll do the Old Testament. And then when it came to the Old, I chose the Psalms, the book of Psalms, which is what I researched on. Well, it's uh, like an interesting uh, and a wonderful lesson of uh, submission also that yes. uh, we don't always <laughs> yes. get to choose what we <laughs> yes, what true. we want to do and we we do struggle with those uh, with those issues yes, yes. right but um we could probably carry on talking about these subjects forever but uh, let's jump into the, this this whole subject of exorcisms and, and and deliverance so you mentioned to me that you work in this ministry but yes. what does it mean and how did you get involved in it? okay then again I, I was i was chosen by the team uh, it's a call the, com the commission on occult and satanism which was set up in 1995. Uh, back then there were six exorcists and they asked to have more help and here in malta in malta yeah. this is malta yes and um, yeah, i one day I, I received a letter in 2014 I received a letter in which I was asked to uh, to join this ministry. And so uh, I, I spent a few days praying over it and thinking about it and discerning. And it was very hard. Actually, I remember my mother saying, she, she said, Stefan, you're very quiet these days. I, I, I was extremely quiet. I felt like a truck had run over me because I wasn't prepared. I was. Uh, I had just come back from Rome. I was uh, kind of growing in the academic life, getting more and more in, deeply involved in, the, in life at university. And then suddenly this thing came along. So uh, I realized how, how serious it is, of course. Uh, there's also a question of time because it's, I know it's time consuming. So uh, apart from that, also the energy, it's not just the time, but the energy <laughs> that it involves, that it requires. And um, I accepted, of course, I was chosen to be uh, an auxiliary exorcist because there are the exorcists and the auxiliary exorcists, which uh, the difference basically is that when, when there are cases of possession, then it's the exorcists who deal with them using the, the liturgical prayers of the church. We deal with all the rest, which, is, which are the most common because exorcisms are actually very few. Uh, and uh, so it, we're dealing with deliverance, even though, yes, you may be involved. I, I have been involved as well in, in a case of exorcism, but chosen specifically for that case, you know. So uh, there again, chosen. <laughs> and, uh, I was chosen for it and, and I, it wasn't my personal choice. But I'm happy to have been selected because I, there again, it is an experience that 
brought me in contact with realities that in my uh, previous years as a priest, I had already been a priest for for about 14 or 15 years, I had not come across these situations, these particular situations that a number of people go through. Uh, and uh, so it was extremely enlightening. It was a new world. And uh, it made me more conscious, yes, of the demonic that that is very, very real. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, my approach probably to the whole ministry, my own, all, all my ministry as a priest, probably changed as, as a result of that. Yes. Well, it seems like in the... Um modern times in the modern world, especially in the West, uh, right, with the advancement of, of, of science and, uh, and all the philosophies that accompany it, um, it, it seems that it's quite even hard to talk about uh, these issues uh, openly <clears throat> and be taken seriously by the mm -hmm. others. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how that would be, you know, taken if you would speak about that at the university and, and things like that. But uh, like in, in the Christian worldview, we have this concept right that's um, both experiential and also it was revealed to us you know mm -hmm. in the scriptures yes, we see that yes. jesus was performing yes. exorcism his disciples and we hear about them you know yes. all the time so we take that there is this spiritual reality this evil reality the spiritual mm -hmm. realm um that is not some immaterial not only well it is immaterial in a sense but not impersonal yeah, um yes, but but right. there you know there's like uh, this personhood, or like not personhood, yes. but maybe a personality in there yes. uh, of sorts that can do things yes. to people, right? Yes. Yes. And it seems to be quite weird, you know, and uh, to, to, to many people, you know, what is that? You know, maybe it's just something that we can't explain if the person is acting weirdly. Maybe it's some psychological pheno phenomenon. Maybe there's some disbalances in some sort of, you know, mm -hmm. like chemicals mm -hmm. in our brains yes. And, yes. and things like that. So. Um, do you encounter, do you yourself encounter skepticism when you talk about these things with, with other people and when those issues come up? Yeah, yeah actually it's probably when, when those issues come up because I, I, tendentially I do not really bring up the subject unnecessarily. And, um, but initially I myself used to think, for example, I, I used to think that if a person has psychological problems, mental problems, mental issues, then it is definitely not, um, anything that has to do with the demonic. And that is what I thought before I joined this ministry. But once I joined it, I realized that very often there are these two elements that go together. Now, if a person is psychologically wounded, mentally wounded, and uh, emotionally wounded, then it is possible for the devil to try and hurt that person even more. So the influence could be, could be there, could, uh, you kind of pay, it paves the way for, for more influence, negative influence. Now, yes, you, you find all sorts of reactions, of course. You find people who believe in these realities and are terribly afraid of them. When, you know, as Christians, we believe that we, we should not fear the devil. I mean, we mustn't be kind of bullies, of course, and we need to respect, in a way, uh, that kind of power. You know, it's, we, we're not, we don't approach it in a way that tries to mock the devil. Um, so we're aware of, of his power and the authority that people have given him, unfortunately, but we need not fear him because faith and fear go against each other. The more we, we believe, the less is the fear we have. When people come to me with a lot of fear, then I, I immediately I can tell that their faith, their awareness of the authority that Jesus has given them is, is very low. And that is where I usually help them. I help them with their faith. Um, uh, but then, of course, you find the other extreme of people who are e extremely uh, s uh, skeptical and um, who do not believe. But th there is little one can do to convince such people, in my opinion. But I heard, I heard a, a famous Protestant exorcist saying that um, in our case, when we do this ministry, we're doing something that is biblical, as you yourself said. And it works. You know, we see people really being delivered. We see changes, radical changes in people. So it's reason enough to, to believe that what we are saying, the theory or the, our understanding, our theology is correct. Uh, it is also consoling uh, in a way, let's put it this way, uh, that a number of, of uh, psychiatrists at times approach us uh, with cases that are beyond the remit in a way. I mean, they, they realize that there is something that is far too sinister, far too complex, uh, that they cannot deal with from the medical point of view. And so uh, they would turn to exorcists and ask for, for our assistance. And, and that is really beautiful because we, we work with 
uh, psychologists, we work with psychiatrists and doctors and so on. And it's important because it's a, it's a holistic approach really and truly. Uh, we can't do it on our own. We need to see what is happening in the medical world, how the person is being assisted and which, because th that is where then in that kind of interface, that, that is where the real issues come out. Yeah? Well, in other words, it seems like, of course, you are not denying that there are psychological and mental issues. There's, you know, physical issues that also might be uh, at play, but there's mm -hmm. uh, something, something more, right? And yes, our worldview, yes. our yeah. worldview allows us to kind of see that. And yes. also when you look yes. at Revelation, mm -hmm. we, we get certain explanations yes. um, uh, 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 of that. But then again, on the other hand, you have a specialists uh, uh, in the medical field who are also sometimes, sometimes perplexed by what yes, is happening yes, and they know right. that it's beyond you know, yes, their reach, yes, so they yes, have yes, to admit that something yes. uh, is happening. And then the third thing is that, uh, like the skeptic, uh, it's, as you said, it might be very hard to convince a skeptic, but uh, it seems that there is some sort of empirical evidence, right? because yes, yes, uh, that when you do something, when you pray, for example, and all the other practices never helped, but, but this particular prayer of yeah. deliverance or an exorcism does help, right? So it kind of uh, makes you think, well, at least it should yeah, make yeah. you think, <laughs> um, right? So, uh, but let us um, be a bit more uh, theological for a moment now. And how could you expound the, the, this whole kind of understanding of who uh, the devil is or Satan? We have different, mm -hmm. different words and, and demons in this, this whole spiritual realm. And yes. What do they do? You know, who they are? Yes, yes. Well, that takes us back to the very, very beginning of the existence of Satan and, and evil spirits. And of course, there are, there are different theories as to how the devil came into being. Of course, we believe that, that God created all things that uh, in goodness, uh, but yet there was this personal choice that could be made by, by all spirits, the spirits that were created. And um, there is a theologian who says that it is possible that the devil, that God did not reveal everything to the angels immediately. But when uh, it was revealed to them that that God would be would become a human being, and that basically you know the human beings are lower in rank in the rank of creation they're lower than than the angels but then when it was clear that the angelic beings would need would have to kneel down before a human being who is who is jesus ultimately then that is when lucifer re rebelled and took it against uh, god and against humanity ultimately as well so uh, so it is possible that this is where how it all began. Now, what do devils do? Uh, devils are intelligent creatures. You, you spoke about this will and, and uh, they think, uh, someone said that they are not tempting people all the time. They are thinking on how to ruin humanity because they are, they are rational beings. And uh, of course they come up with plans. They, they actually come up with plans on how to uh, harm humanity even more because they can't hurt God directly, so it's, they, they can only hurt him by hurting his most precious of creations, that is humanity. Um, uh, so I don't know whether I've, I've answered your question, maybe I can expound a bit more on... No, on... no, no, it's good. It's a, it's, a, it's a good starting point, right? So we, we have those um, rational creatures and they're somewhat different theories of how, you know, the devil um, kind of, well, Lucifer came to be, you know, the be most beautiful yes, of yes, angels, yes. how he fell, right? But yes. he did indeed, uh, you know, a fall and then he kind of dragged some other spirits yes, with him right, and then they right. rebelled against God, so to say. So yeah. they did rebel against God and now they're trying to, uh, as you said, ruin, ruin humanity and they're devising plans and, and, and they've been doing that for, you know, um, yes. time immemorial, as, you know, <laughs> like, as long as the humanity was, you know, the, there, was, there was them, you know, because they were created before us. Um, and they're, you know, and it seems like, uh, well, I mean, this, this spiritual reality is, of course, all around us, you know, yeah, even as we right, speak, right? right? I mean, they, they're, right. and those kind of two realms of the spiritual realm and our physical realm, they do overlap uh, sometimes. So uh, the question is now, how can, a, how can this kind of spiritual realm or these spiritual beings have an effect yes, on, on us? On our lives. Yeah, because I, because mm -hmm. we, we're, it seems like we're we're kind of, you know quite different, right? Yes, and uh, we, yes. we have a body. Demons they, they don't have a body, right? That's and right, there's a whole right. theology how can they you know kind of maybe create a body or, or okay, like okay. or, or possess or, or appear, appear, uh, yes, or appear yes, in, yes, in, yes. in certain yeah instances. So 
So how does that interaction yeah, the, happen? The two Corinthians says, no, and Saint Paul says that the, the devil masquerades as an angel of light, so he can actually manifest himself in some way. All right. But I, I always uh, try to I distinguish between two forms of manifestation or influence, negative influence of the devil. Uh, the first one, the, the most common of all, is temptations. Uh, we are constantly bombarded in a way uh, to act against God's will. And of course, in some ways, I believe that the, that the devil can suggest evil to human beings. Now, how, how he does it, I'm not too sure, but probably being, being a spirit, um, he can somehow communicate thoughts somehow. Uh, so they may not always, of course they may find their, have their origin in us, but I strongly believe that there can also be this external influence, even when it comes to thinking. This is what the temptation essentially is. It's, um, it's being allured to do something that is not in conformity with God's will. Um, and that does it, doesn't always find its source in the human being. Uh, the other form of attack, of demonic attack, is um, what we often see in this ministry, people who are somehow, like the devil doesn't simply try to make us sin, but he also tries to, uh, to, to, to damage our lives, but even on, on, on the, on, on, in various spheres, for example, people can be influenced in their health, in their finances, their work, their, their relationship with God, their relationship with others, uh, in, in various areas, so, so psychologically, uh, so you can see that sometimes his influence is of that nature. And, uh, and of course, people might be, as we said earlier, skeptical and they might think, oh, yes, it's just he, he's not doing well in his business and that's it. But uh, very often the people who come to us would have, would, be, would have problems in so many areas of life at the same time. And they usually use an expression. In Maltese, they use an expression which is like, I just, uh, I can't breathe. When, when, when a person tells you, I can't breathe, it's a, it, it really means I've had enough and I can't find the strength to come up on my feet again. And uh, this is when, when I hear this, this, this phrase being used, I usually think, okay, mm, this, well, of course it may not be demonic, but, but it, it generally tends to be. And uh, so these two areas, and uh, sometimes they go together, sometimes as a result of sin, as a result of uh, some kind of meddlement with the occult, then people are exposed to more harm, of course, in other areas of their life. Or sometimes people are trying to live a good life and yet they, they are influenced in this negative way. So, for example, even accidents. Sometimes we might think an accident is an accident, but I believe there are instances when there is a demonic attack in that area as well. Uh, so, so one mustn't, mustn't uh, just, mm, just assume that things are simply on the human level. You said, you know, that the spiritual and the human over, often overlap. And, and I see this happening very, very much so. Uh, it's, it's something that really impresses me, actually, how, how the demonic can influence our lives and how the good spiritual realities can influence our lives as well, because we are really in touch with these realities that are all around us. And Jesus speaks about the devil as the prince of the air, the prince of this world. So you, ca you can imagine how, how much influence he can have on humanity. So there's a podcast by two Orthodox priests. Uh, it's called the Lord of Spirits. And mm -hmm. they're basically over there, they're talking about how we in the modern world somehow manage to detach ourselves from those, the understanding of the um, broader kind of reality that uh, it's not, not everything is physical, sort of, even Christians, like we, we tend to kind of explain everything in purely ma yes, materialistic yes, terms. Yes, yes. And, and if something kind of uh, spiritual or um, comes up, or let's say if a prayer gets answered, yes. all of us get surprised because, you know, this is not yes. supposed kind of to happen, yes, but yes. they say it's because mostly we, we kind of live in this kind of f flat reality and mm -hmm. the, the reality is much broader. Yes. But then you have C.S. Lewis also who, who says, uh, a Protestant thinker, um, and he says that it seems like the devil wants 
us to be in one of the other extreme. One extreme would be just finding him ev under every rock yes, sort yes, of and, yes. and making everything seem uh, for example i drop my spoon no this is the devil you okay, know maybe yeah, do it yeah. um or, or i spilled my coffee you know whatever yeah. but then the yeah. other extreme is <laughs> the other extreme is that uh well there's no such thing as devil right so both extremes are good you know for the devil one when you're when you're just constantly kind of preoccupied of thinking about yeah, him yeah. and the demonic and you're even maybe you know kind of too interested or even afraid um, at times and the others when they kind of neglect that well well in truth i mean the, the the spiritual reality is always you know active always always working but our reality is it seems to to be like fairly complex right because human yes. beings we are soul spiritual and beings, right? yeah, yeah we're yeah, also yeah, spiritual yeah, beings yeah, right so right, so right. we were like a unity of of, mm -hmm. of body and soul mm -hmm. right of course different denominations might have different uh, <laughs> okay, uh different yeah, yeah, yeah. theologies on, on that but but we, we are indeed spiritual beings also um, um in a sense so i think it's a it's a it's a wonderful you know kind of point that you also kind of brought up because uh this the spiritual reality is being active sometimes when everything seems to be uh, working just in a plainly natural kind of level mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. we might um, might not address the reality as it is. So, and then I guess it leads to um, to um, to the need of the kind of prayer and not only solving everything on a natural plane, but right. Right, you know, approaching you know uh, God with our, with our petitions and, and prayers. But I also wanted to ask um, after this monologue for some reason that I just you know came no, up with. Okay, it's a dialogue. <laughs> it's a dialogue. But, uh, no, no, no. But, but um, what I wanted to ask uh, is. What is the procedure, I guess, uh, when, you know, you meet a person uh, mm -hmm. who is thinking that uh, maybe something is happening in my life or maybe that person is not thinking anything about the spiritual world and they just kind of, you know, struggling and, and that's yeah, it. And yeah. you see something, as you just mentioned, that you have an insight yeah. uh, that maybe something uh, might, be, might be happening. So what is the, the whole procedure of kind of assessing yeah, if a person okay. is possessed or maybe oppressed, yeah, oppressed I assume there are different probably, kinds, yeah, right? That's right, that's um, right. And, and then, so what, what do you do? How does it go? Yeah, usually, of course, I give a lot of time to listening to the person to try and understand what they're saying and to understand their context. <clears throat> also to see, yes, uh, uh, to try, uh, you try to assess, <clears throat> excuse me, what is possibly psychological and what is possibly beyond the psychological, the purely psychological, but it comes, of course, from the, the kind of descriptions they give you, the experiences they share with you, and <clears throat> you can at times see certain similarities to other other experiences, which you, other other cases. Uh, let's let's call them the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, that helps listening to the person, even in a prayerful way, uh, helps you to understand the, understand the situation a bit better. But then my general procedure is, is always to bring in Jesus and to try to connect them to, to Christ. Because um, I believe that usually when people come to us, this is the most important uh, issue at stake. Uh, it's the fact that they have either drifted away and a huge number of people who come to seek our help would have drifted away from the faith. It's, it's only a small percentage of people who are really in the faith and who are yet being attacked uh, diabolically, let's, let's put it this way. Um, so my first, my first, not hunch, but my first approach is always to try to see where they are with Jesus, how connected they are to Him. And generally, most people tell me that they've been disconnected from the church, from the sacraments, from prayer for a long time. So then you, you can immediately tell, you know, this is one of the problems. And, and I believe that by helping the person to focus once again on Christ, on uh, being aware of how their faith in Jesus and His power can bring them salvation and and the the, the, the deliverance they need. Uh, th this is extremely important because sometimes, unfortunately, people approach us and uh, they think that what we do is a bit magical. You know, they a number of people, for example, go to fortune tellers, you know, and they do all the rites and the rituals and so on, and they give them the potions and the powders and all that and the thing, the talismans to carry around and the, all that, and and. Um, 
And then they come to us because they, their problems have been so, haven't, haven't been solved or actually they have got, actually gotten worse. Uh, they come to us and, for example, they'd ask me, Father, they'd call me, now, Father, are you, the, are you the one who, who removes spells? Like, uh, well, <laughs> I wouldn't like to be <laughs> known as the, a priest who removes spells. I mean, I'd rather be a, a priest who helps people come to Jesus, you know, and find the liberty in Jesus and freedom in Jesus. So, yes, they, they, they do approach us in that way sometimes. Okay, you do your prayers, you do your rituals, and I'll be free, and then I'll go back to my old life, and, and things will be okay. But no, there needs to be a conversion, a change of life, and this is what I insist on mostly. Um, with the other cases you mentioned, where people might be oppressed without their knowing it, of course, then, yes, my approach is always ultimately to point them to Jesus, but then if they are not actually seeking your help immediately, uh, or directly, then it can be a bit difficult to convince them that this is another reality in their lives. But I, 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 I would try to um, explain this without scaring people. <laughs> I always try, in my conversations, I always try to keep things as calm and as, as um, uh, unimpressive as possible. You know, I don't try to impress people. I, I know that sometimes there have been cases where people were made to believe that they have an evil spirit in them and all that and it becomes a bit of a show and now we're going to remove this evil spirit and no no it's it's it shouldn't be that way you know there should always be respect and the focus should be Christ ultimately otherwise it becomes a real show and it's it's not healthy it's not right yeah, uh, yeah because some people also you know like um, the ones that I already mentioned with, with this uh, Kind of this this naturalistic uh, or materialistic <coughs> worldview, they they kind of say, oh, if it's real, you know, give give me some camera footage, you know, whatever. But yes, yes. but you know, it's it as you said, it's not for a show, you know. Yes, we, yes. Nobody's recording those those yes, things, just right, kind yes. of to show other people and kind yes. of because you know we are convinced, so we That's so we know right. they're they're happening. You know, God is going to convince uh, anybody else who's you know who needs to be you know convinced. Mm -hmm. But then it's not going to you know become a spectacle, you know, yes, of, yes, of yes, all yes. this thing, right? So I assume, I mean, like uh, I heard that the Catholic Church has a position that they don't even allow the exosomes to be filmed, right? Is that uh, is that correct? I, I I, I, um, to be honest, I'm not too sure whether it is a, an official position. I, I I wouldn't think so, but as a practice, it, it is not. They're not usually they're not filmed. No, they wouldn't be filmed at all. Um, I don't know of any cases of of such such uh, events being filmed. Uh, because the person's dignity must be always respected, of course, and. Uh, yeah, well, how would you use it? What do you use it for? People will, people could actually see this this kind of footage and still think it's it's psychological. If they don't want to believe, they will still think, ah, she's being influenced by those prayers and she's reacting to those prayers and it's not really the person, as in it's just the person's mind. So um, no matter how much footage you show, it's, it's, it depends on how, even though <laughs> um, the, the president of our commission was once kind of, somehow challenged i think or approached by by a journalist who didn't believe at all in in exorcisms and the 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 sexist asked him to join him for one of the sessions that he had and he went out in trepidation he was so terrified i mean he realized that he was he had come in touch with a reality that is really demonic. So he, he, he came out a changed man. So that, in that case, it did help him, but it's not quite, it's not generally something we, yeah, we yeah, do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yes. Well, um, that reminds me of a, of a story, how I um, also tried to be delicate, you know, uh, about it. But I came to faith uh, in Jesus like six years ago and, we, the, and maybe five years ago, so maybe a year after that. But I, I did believe in the spiritual realm. It wasn't a problem for me, but there was a group of us uh, five or six guys were geocaching in Vilnius uh, mm -hmm. in, in the old town. So looking for kind of clues, you know, uh, yes. using the GPS, kind mm -hmm. of you find a clue, you, you yes. go to you find yes. another clue and things like that. So we were doing that. Um, and then uh, we, we came to one, you know, to, to a wall of one Catholic church, even though it's like in the middle of the, of the old town, there was like a big yard that kind of separated it from all the other, like the busy streets. Mm -hmm. So in the yard, there was, you know, nothing. So we, we, we kind of came up to that wall and we're looking for that clue, you know, somewhere hidden. And we heard screams from within the church, okay. you know, and we kind of, all of us were perplexed and none of us were Catholics also. Okay. Um, uh, so we came to the door. For some reason, we saw that there was a, a lock put on the door, but it wasn't locked. 
So there was a lock, but we wasn't locked. So for some reason, you know, I decided to remove that lock and open the door to see what was happening because I thought maybe a child is screaming. And but other people said, no, no, it's definitely not a child, something, something else. But, you know, we didn't know what was happening. We opened the door, you know, and I saw like it was a movie scene almost. We saw uh, a priest at the altar. It was already kind of evening, like, you know, dusk. And uh, we saw him rec reciting prayers and there was a person crawling on, you mm -hmm. know, on their knees. Mm -hmm. um, and and we just closed the door and we we didn't <laughs> right. know what was, and, and for we, your lives <laughs> no, no, no 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 i mean we, and didn't because um i think all almost all of us were christians except for one guy who was okay. undecided he was not you know like he didn't know if was he, he was a christian or not and, and things like that so and we didn't know what to do do we do we kind of you know help i mean yeah, we yeah, had no yes, concept yes, you know yes, yes, of, yes. of what to do in those situations even though some other people have experienced in the evangelical circles, you know, have experienced, yeah. you know, some deliverance. Um, well, not themselves, but they saw something happening in, in, in the services. But there was one guy who was from a Baptist church and he was like pretty skeptical of, 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 yeah. of these things yes. happening. Um, even though he believed in, in theory that, um, you know, uh, might happen. But so for some reason, we decided to crack the door open one, once again. And that that person started running towards us. And then like the, the face of that, it was a woman. And the face of that person, uh, it was, I mean, I, I couldn't describe it. It was just like some, something else, right? Um, it was something else. And, and then, you know, my, my, my friend, you know, just kind of raised the hand, said, stop in Jesus' name. And, you know, we kind of closed the door. And, uh, and then, you know, we just heard, uh, you know, that woman kind of cursing in, 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 in Russian, in another language, uh, very loudly. And then we heard several thumps, like really big, I'm like, uh, how do you call those uh, like pews kind of you yeah, know yeah, being yeah, smashed yeah, yeah, in, yeah, inside yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and we prayed we sang you know yeah. hymns you know outside but we maybe we we probably disrupted all the things that the, the priest was doing so it wasn't a good thing you know uh, that we did <laughs> but we didn't know we wanted to kind of to help <laughs> right, you know some, right. some somehow you know and we didn't want to kind of be too curious but, but your prayers would have had definitely well, well, hopefully yes, i yes. mean but we stand you know stand outside you know all hugged and we kind of and yes. and we kind of prayed and and, and prayed and prayed but then, you know, there was this kind of weird feeling I, I had for a month that, you know, something was, you know, kind of, you know, very close to me and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. like, a, like a, something, something evil, right? Yes, yes. And I never experienced that, you know, uh, before or after, you know, that was kind of, uh, there's a very weird kind of uh, experience. So that, of course, even though I didn't need convincing, much convincing, but I, but I, I was convinced also by this experience right, that, this, right, that, that, right. that this happened. So, um, and, and that, you know, kind of made me scared in a sense uh, because, you know, I've never seen it. And I knew that, you know, Jesus protected me and he's, you know, with me. Mm -hmm. But there was this kind of sense of, you know, like a deeper so sense of evil yes. that, you know, there is this kind of evil who's very personal and who wants to terrify. Yeah. You, may I stop you for a while, Lorna? So you're reminding me of an exorcist in Malta who had a very heavy exorcism session. And he said when he went back home and he just um, was in bed about to sleep, he just felt this was this was just a one a one time episode he just felt a real evil presence behind him and he said i didn't turn around because i felt that if, had i turned around i would have actually seen the devil like th that is how real it felt and he just slept and and stopped there but but it's kind of you reminding me of this kind of experience where for some reason this evil manifests itself um uh, Maybe to annoy us, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, and like you, you also um, uh, asked me about uh, the Holy Fools just before yes. we started recording this, this, this whole thing because um, they, they actually went to the desert. Some of them went to the desert, like the Desert Fathers, where they were not all Holy Fools, of course, what we call the Holy Fools. And most of them uh, went to the city, you know, um, and that's the concept of the Holy Fool gets, you know, this kind of full explication within the, 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 the environment of a city. But some of them, um, it would would not some of them, but all of them would fight the demonic in a very you know kind of personal a personal way. And some of them, even though you said you know we shouldn't kind of uh, you know mock uh, the devil, yes, but yes. the holy fools, what they did. But it's only like a very small subset of yes, you know yes, the, yes, uh, the, yes. the people. They did do that. So there was like a, a, a like there's a story about one guy. I don't remember his name, but. Uh, like the devil would come to visit him almost every night and to terrify him mm -hmm. because of the holy life that he was leading. Yes, yes. And eventually, I mean, at, at the beginning he was kind of, kind of scared because of this real, you know, spiritual presence that was manifesting itself. But then eventually he got, he, he kind of grew to, to, to kind of uh, like familiar with that, with that spirit. Mm -hmm. And 
and uh, not in like in a in a good sense that they're yes, fans or anything, yes. but but like he he wasn't scared at all. And like when he would kind of see him manifest, they would say, "Oh, it's you." I think it was Bluebeard, like or something like that. Okay. Oh, it's you, you know. And he would go back to sleep, you know. So it's like eventually yes. for him, he was the least right. terrifying thing, yes. you know. Uh, eventually, the, the, the Smith Wigglesworth as well, who was a great Protestant mm. who performed a lot of miracles in the name of Jesus and raised people from the dead as well. And uh, in one of his books, says that uh, at one point he heard something shuffling at the end of his bed he was asleep and he put he, he lit his candle and saw the devil at the, at the edge of his bed and um, and that was his reaction ah oh, it's only you he blew out the candle and went back to sleep so i think it's a, <laughs> yeah, that just, amazing yeah that just shows you know the, the deepness of faith but like when you were now talking about your personal experiences you don't mm -hmm. have to expound them but just uh, kind of uh, to get a sense of what does it feel like, you know, being in this in in, in this environment the whole time and and, and dealing with that? Uh, I mean, do you get kind of troubled sometimes, you know, by by that? You know, do you get exhausted? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. do you get scared? You know, and 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 things like that. Yeah. Um, so actually, you said being involved in this all the time. I, I'm not, thank God, <laughs> because the, the exorcists and when, whenever we meet up, uh, we, they always say. It's important that we don't do we do not do this work full time because it's too taxing and too exhausting, and um, it's a bit too dark as well. In a way, even though it's beautiful, because uh, the, 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 you always see Jesus at work and you see people the way Jesus is setting people free. So it's also extremely rewarding, extremely, but very exhausting undoubtedly because the people who come to us are really, really, very often extremely burdened. And, and of course, it's, it's a process. It, uh, things don't change uh, overnight. Sometimes you see a change uh, after one session. Sometimes it takes, it takes months and months and months before a person starts really changing. So um, my, my most difficult experience, I guess, is, is the pressure that these situations create and, and the fact that I try to be there for them as soon as I can, because a number of them are always kind of you know, they tell you it's urgent, it's urgent. Of course, um, they'd be very heavy, they'd be feeling very heavy and they want to get rid of their problems and, and deal with them as soon as they, as they can, especially if they, had, if they have had some, uh, some recent kind of manifestation which really scared them uh, at home or whatever. So, so then they want your immediate help. And then it, and that, that is what, more than the, um, uh, the feeling of fear or feeling scared, actually I thought that as, as an exorcist I would never feel afraid, but the more seasoned exorcists uh, in the team tell me that there are times when they do feel afraid, like, like, uh, quite, quite, quite a lot. In very, on very rare occasions, but, but it, it could happen. So I realized that I'm not a superman, even though, yes, you believe, but yet there can be situations which really uh, make you feel extremely uncomfortable or possibly even fearful. But then that, that uh, invites us, that's an, uh, an opportunity for another act of faith in Jesus and his power. And, uh, you know, I mean, after all, we're, we're like all other Christians, but of course our faith should be extreme, extremely deep, ultimately, it should be very deep. Uh, so I guess that is the, the thing, thing I deal with mostly, is the difficulty, of course, then when you feel so pressured then you feel tired, and if you're tired, then your prayer life could be affected, and that is when things start going wrong, no? And then you can't do anything right, and then you have to catch up with your university work and other, other, other appointments and so on. So, um, of course, the devil is very intelligent. He will not always try to crush us by, I don't know, causing us to sin or whatever, but even keeping us away from prayer, making us too busy and all that. These can be his, his tactics as well. So we must be very, very careful. And I, I, can, I can see those in my life and I'm, I'm aware of them, you know? Well, th that reminds me also of this uh, one um, exorcist in Lithuania. We have a very, one very famous exorcist and, and uh, like he's invited to, to speak pretty much everywhere. And, and uh, he also said that, you know, like this, this, this kind of work is very tiring and being in contact with mm -hmm. this kind of reality, you know, can be really, really uh, tiring and, 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 and tiresome uh, at times. So it's, it's, it kind of also reminds you that you are, as you said, you know, you are, a, you know, like you are a person also, yeah, right? Yeah, with yeah. Uh, uh, no and needs. you're not a superman, right? <laughs> you're not, true. you use yourself. And, and also about, uh, it reminded me of one uh, verse in the scriptures where Jesus says that, 
uh, this particular breed, for example, is only cast out by fasting and prayer, right? So it's, it's right, not always, right. because some people say that, you know, um, if you have enough faith, faith uh, you just kind of, you know, say, you know, be gone in Jesus' name, and this is yes, how it happens, yes, yes, right? Yes. But it seems to contradict the scriptures in a sense, <clears throat> right? And uh, it seems experience and reality, because, right, it's yeah, not yeah, every yeah, time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, or maybe even uh, less often than not, uh, it, it's it, it, like it's a long process. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's strong. Sometimes they carry on for years. I mean, you hear of exorcisms that take on, that take, that carry on for a number of years, and it, it's perplexing. You, you just wonder why it doesn't happen faster. But um, I, I'm not too sure what to say. It's there might be other issues as well. Sometimes there's also a question of. Um, inner healing that needs to be done before the actual exorcism because some people might think it's just of a spiritual or demonic nature and they they do not pay enough uh, due attention to the inner hurts and of course if there are inner hurts the devil will always find a way of lodging himself there so you, you won't be able to cast out an evil spirit if you haven't dealt with those deep emotional issues and and we we encounter a lot of people who have huge hurts coming from childhood and of course these take take a, a long time inner healing takes a long time it, it, it's a long process you have to accompany the person pray with them uh, very often of course they have to do their part they have to open up to christ's help as well and his grace and they want they they would need to uh, I don't mean to be unkind, but in some cases, of course, you need to discern this as well. But some people are happy to be victims, you know, and, and they, they would, it, 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 they'd be comfortable being in that situation where, where they're craving attention and people's help all the time. So a person has to decide, no, I want to stop being a victim. Uh, unless a person does, does that. I mean, you can never really set that person free. So there, there are a lot of issues. There can also be the issue of, of forgiveness. A person could be struggling with forgiveness. If there isn't sincere forgiveness uh, towards those who have hurt you, probably even, yes, in childhood and all that, then again, the devil always has a hold on, on the person. I, I like explaining this to, to the people who come to me with such hurts. I tell them, if, if uh, you do not forgive, that is a playground for the devil. He will always have a way of actually um, having a hold on you in some way or other. But if you forgive or everyone, then he will approach you and, and not be able to latch on or uh, attach himself to you in any way. So, yeah, but there, there would be various issues at play and, and um, uh, it, it could take a long time before, before all are resolved. On the other hand, there are also those situations which happen instantly. For example, I'll just share one experience with you of, um, of a woman who was um, going out with with uh, with with um, a person from North Africa, and she knew for a fact because she was told by a family member of the of her partner that the mother of her partner had cast a spell on her, and um, and she she was having various issues like manifestations at home and um, other such experiences. So. The first thing we did was the, the, the parish priest had asked me to see her. So I told her, okay, why don't you first confess your sins to the parish priest where he will give you the, um, the sacrament of, of reconciliation. You will re be reconciled to Christ, ask for forgiveness, be reconciled to Jesus, receive his mercy, and then be open to uh, receiving more freedom. No? We always say that as an aside, that a, a good confession is better than, is stronger than an exorcism. Because some people think that an exorcism is so much more impressive and all that, but when you actually confess your sins, even if it's not to a priest, even if, even if it's not in a Catholic setting, but if you are sincere before God and you repent of your sins, that is when your soul is set free. So that, that is much greater than an exorcism because in an exorcism, it is uh, the body that is being set free of this negative influence. It's not one's soul. Uh, so, Anyway, after having uh, confessed, we went in, I went in again and we prayed with her for maybe five or ten minutes. And at one point she just said, the pain is gone. And we said, what pain? She hadn't mentioned any pain. She, she said, I've been having a constant pain in my stomach for these past um, months. I don't know how long it was, but months. It was months on end. She said, okay. 
okay, this, this, this sounds good, like let's thank God. And so we thank God and we praised Him and all that. I met her a month later, she said the pain was completely gone. You know, so of course that is very often a symptom. If there's pain in the head or in the stomach, it could be. I don't want to worry anyone in case someone has a tummy ache uh, after watching the, the program <laughs> and thinks, oh, there might be an evil spirit. It's not, not the, it might not be the case. Um, but sometimes when, when spells are cast, you know, it could be, it could be a, a, um, an indication. So she was set free instantly and she never came back because she didn't need to. Actually, I did meet her a month later, but in, uh, um, by chance. And she said, no, I'm fine and I'm really happy. She's, so there are different situations, yeah. you know. So let us finish with uh, one last question, which might sound a bit controversial, but we'll see. Hopefully not. Okay. Not too much, at least. Okay. Uh, so uh, there are different uh, you know, views that people take, um, like from different confessions on exorcism and who can perform it. Yes. Um, yes. So um, I don't know, if, you know, what, what's your stance? What's your particular stance? Uh, some, of, some of the Catholics are a bit stronger than others, for example, saying that a real exorcism can only be performed within the Catholic Church, right? Then the question is how about the Orthodox yes, or the Protestants? Yes, yes, yes. But I've also seen one Protestant exorcist coming to uh, Rome to meet with Gabriel Amorth, who yes. used to be yes. one of the, the most, chief exorcist you know, there, yeah, yes. the, the, most, the most famous one. But he was kind of quite acceptive of what he was doing, you know, the, the mm -hmm. Protestant. So the, the uh, what is it or orthodox? Is it uh, pro Protestant, 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 Protestant. Yeah, yeah, there was sorry. a Protestant. But I'm just saying that okay. I, I'm not sure what about, you know, like okay. what would be the views of, you know, Catholics and Orthodox, yes. at, you know, yes. each other, how they do, you know, those things. Um, I do have a, a friend who's a, who's an Orthodox priest, I could, I, and I've heard that he also been involved in, 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 in okay. doing exorcism, okay. so I, I need to ask him. But the, uh, my question would be this. Um, so what would be kind of your take on maybe there's a, an official position that the Catholic uh, Church takes on, let's say, uh, doing exorcism, exorcisms within different denominational settings, for example, because they, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard about those, I mean, I've never seen, um, I've even never seen any, but, uh, but I've heard about them, you know, my friends talking about those because I myself am evangelical. So what would be the approach that, you know, that you or the Catholic uh, okay. Church would take about those exorcisms happening within in other, other denominations? Yes, other denominations. Oh, yes, undoubtedly. I have no doubt that if uh, the people who are doing it are, are spiritually mature and who, are, who really have faith, uh, the Lord will, will accept their prayer and, and, and set, set the person free. I have no doubt about that, be they Protestant, be they Orthodox. Uh, and and uh, yes, as long as it happens in the name of Jesus, you know, in the name of Jesus. Of course, the, the church, well, there is a difference between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. In the case of the Orthodox Church, all priests are, are exorcists automatically. In the Catholic Church, Technically speaking, we are all exorcists, but the kind of the Archbishop reserves reserves the right, as in withholds our right of of performing exorcism. So we can only do so with his blessing. Now, uh, one thing that is well, I can say two things. First of all, why does the Church reserve exorcism prayers only to a few priests, to those that the Archbishop chooses ultimately? Um, it's it's because it's as we have been saying it's it's a it's a practice that involves a lot of discernment a lot of maturity yes a life of prayer as well and and uh, formation training I mean we meet on a monthly basis and we discuss cases and and some of them can be very complex and you realize that you need a lot of experience you can't just be um, uh, you know, a priest without any experience and be sent to do exorcisms because one can make mistakes and, and, and it's a complex reality, especially when, when there is the merging of the spiritual and the psychological and, and the other issues. So the church has her mind at rest if there, there are a few priests who are kind of trained and, and who become experts who have all the skills necessary in order to deal with these del delicate situations. Another issue that goes with this is that the devil seems to be very legalistic. Um, somehow, I, I attribute this also to the importance of obedience. The Catholic Church has chosen this structure. And so, for some reason, um, if, I am not, I, if I am not authorized by the Archbishop, even though I am a priest with a lot of belief and all that, and a lot of deep faith and all that in Jesus, 
But because my structure, the structure I belong to, the, the community, the community of believers, the, the church I belong to, has this structure, what is most important is not my faith, but my obedience. It's the unity of the church that is most, most important. So if I am a priest who is not officially an exorcist and I try to perform an exorcism, it is the case that the devil uh, is empowered not to obey me, not to obey my, 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 my commands. Why? Because I am not truly in union with the church, with the whole church, my church in that case, of course, despite my faith. And, uh, but then you see that in certain cases, you know, when, when, when you have the authorization of the bishop, when the whole denomination is behind you, the whole church is behind and there's unity, then your authority is much, much stronger. Uh, so I believe that that is what is most important. It's not just one's faith, but it is uh, the broader context of the church, the person being empowered. We also say that there is also this view that, um, okay, when it comes to the official liturgical prayers of the church, which are either in Latin or in, in uh, the various languages that we use, uh, then it's only the exorcists who may use them. But w as prayers of deliverance and possibly even verging on exorcism, there are those who believe that if a person has authority over another, for example, in the case of parents praying over their child or the leader of a community of a prayer group who has, of course, the, 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 his, his community who, who, is, who he is spiritually responsible for somehow, then that person may pray over people who are under his um, guardianship or, or whatever. So, um, and I think this makes sense, but of course the person has to be, have the necessary training. Uh, but ultimately, yes, when it comes to exorcisms that are particularly of a difficult nature, then you should ask the experts, well, this is why, why the exorcists are there after all, you know, to try and help in the best way possible. Well, thank you so much, Stefan. Thank welcome. you for this conversation. Welcome. May God bless you and your ministry. <laughs> thank you. God bless you too, Lorenz. <laughs>